There's a new look to the Orange County Board of Supervisors. Three Asian Americans, two of them women, out of five total. Is there a new way of governing, too? Well, we talk policy and politics with the new bosses of the Board of Supervisors, Lisa Bartlett and Michelle Steele, next on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by Five Point. Five Point is an independent real estate development company with assets under management across California. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Memorial Care is transforming the way healthcare is delivered, keeping our communities and businesses healthy by guiding them on the path to wellness with easily accessible hospitals, physician offices, and outpatient centers. Memorial Care, leading the way. Hi, I'm Rick Reef. Welcome to Inside OC. Term limits and the siren call of Sacramento have caused a lot of turnover lately on Orange County's Board of Supervisors. Three of the five members have less than two years experience, and all three of the newcomers are Asian Americans. Two are women, and they're both here. Joining me, former Dana Point Mayor, now Supervisor representing South County and new Chairwoman of the Board, Lisa Bartlett. Also joining, former member of the State Board of Equalization, now a supervisor representing North and Central Coastal OC, and the new vice chair of the board, Michelle Steele. Lisa, Michelle, welcome. Thank you. Thank you Thanks for, for coming on. So, so Lisa, three of the five members of the Board of Supervisors, Asian Americans, throughout the county, there are a lot on the local level of Asian Americans who have in recent years been elected. Uh, you don't see that. I can't think anywhere else in the country, elsewhere in the country where you see that. What's, what's happening in Orange County? Well, I think that Orange County is becoming more diverse. Our population is still growing, and the Asian population in Orange County is also growing. Michelle, your thoughts on that? You know, it's really interesting because Lisa and I represent the, the least Asian population districts. So the other three has more Asians than us. I have less than 10% in my district. And I think people are just looking at us and how serious we are. And then, you know, it doesn't really matter we are Asian Americans, but, you know, the way that we deliver our messages, and that's the way we got elected. Yeah, I noticed uh, your names, uh, Bartlett and Steele, are not your maiden <laughs> names, I, I, I assume. Uh, and, uh, and yet, you, you know, a lot of politicians will use if they're Latino and they're in a Latino district, even mm -hmm. if they get married, you know, and they have a uh, Anglo name, they'll mm -hmm. use the, uh, uh, and you don't do that. Is that, a, is that a conscious thing or is it just something you've never even thought of doing? It's something that I never even thought about. But the fact that we are, um, three Asians elected to the Board of Supervisors, we weren't elected because we were Asian. We were elected because mm -hmm. our constituents felt we were the most qualified candidates for serving on the Board of Supervisors. Okay, and so does ethnicity have, have any significance in your opinion? As far as getting elected, I don't think ethnicity had anything um, significant about getting us elected to office. And well, you? I've been using Michelle Steele for the last 10 years. When I got elected for state board of equalization, I was using Michelle Steele. So, you know, I never thought that, you know, I have to change to Michelle Park Steele or right. Michelle Park. So let's talk a little bit about each of your backgrounds. Let's start with you, Michelle. Uh, where were you born uh, and, and so forth? How'd you want, I, and how did you wind up getting into politics? Really? I was born in Korea, and I was raised in Japan. So I came here to go to college. I speak English as my third language. Third language, so you speak? Korean is my first and Japanese my second. Okay. And actually, as a first generation, I never thought Lisa as an Asian American. You know, when I saw her, I thought she was half Asian, but I never thought she was full Japanese American. So, you know, when you come here to go to college, especially when you have an accent, you're never really thinking about running for public office. But the Board of Equalization was different because they actually harassed my mom, that who was a teacher all her life in Korea and Japan, and she opened a clothing shop in downtown Los Angeles. And, you know, it's a tax agency. They harassed her, so she paid the tax, taxes that she didn't owe, plus 
you know, penalty and interest on the top of it. So I said, I think I'm going to do a much better job to protect taxpayers. That's the way my political career started. So that's how you got, because your mother ran a shop. She was not treated well by mm -hmm. the tax authorities. Right. And so you decided you were going to go on that tax mm -hmm. board to, to make a difference. To teach them lessons. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's, <laughs> that's interesting. And Lisa, how about your background? Well, I was uh, born in Culver City, moved to Orange County when I was three. So I remember Orange County when it was full of orange groves. And uh, this will date me a little bit. Um, I attended UC Irvine after high school. And at, at that time, UC Irvine had five buildings on the campus, and the bookstore was a trailer across the street. So I've wow. seen Orange County really grow up over the years. And I've been a resident of Dana Point now for the past 25 years. Wow. And what was uh, your father, what was his, your mom and your father, what were their ethnicities? Um, they were uh, Japanese American. Uh, they were born were in they Hawaii. Oh, OK. Yes. And my father was a chemical engineer. My mother was a school teacher. Now, do you speak Japanese? Uh, Squashy, a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. Yes. So in the house, that isn't something that was spoken. Not too much. And so you are, uh, I, I mean, so it's, uh, to you, uh, eth ethnicity, is it's just like any, anybody else uh, or, you know, it's. Well, I grew up with a lot of traditional, you know, Japanese customs. And uh -huh. when, when uh, my friends were eating McDonald's hamburgers, I grew up on sashimi. Oh, you did? Okay. Yes. All right. And. Uh, Michelle, when uh, I know with Suki Kang, mm -hmm. who is a uh, like you, a Korean American, mm -hmm. when he was mayor of Irvine, he would go to Korea and he was like royalty because right. in Korea, mm -hmm. being a mayor is a big deal, right? And they thought it was like Rudy Giuliani coming or something. Exactly, right? exactly. Mayor means really big in Korea. So when I went last year, and they said, what do you do, supervisor? Some supermarket supervisor. That's the way they asked me. So I said, oh, supermarket supervisor can get elected in Korea. You know, I didn't even know. So when I was invited by Korean government, then one of the city mayor, really small city, and he was invited and he actually got the business class tickets and they were refusing to give me the business class because the supervisor is really nothing of a job. So they don't understand that exactly what we are doing. So mayor of a small town in California gets the business class exactly. to go over there and you had a fly coach. That's right. That's right. Okay. okay. So that, that's, uh, that's a little bit of a come down. Uh, did, were you <laughs> able to explain to them just how important you were? <laughs> I, I told them I am top of 34 city mayors mayor. That's the way I explained to them. They still don't get it. Yeah. Why, why do you think it is, though, again, it, it just seems like in Orange County, there have been so many uh, Asian Americans who have been able to get into politics, and you don't see that uh, any, anywhere else. Well, I think as Orange County becomes more diverse, um, the Asian population is growing. And I think that the Asian Americans in particular find that getting more involved in their in their cities and at the county level and at the state and federal level can help their the Asian community in general. And it just brings a different perspective to the table, different level of experience. And what I'm hearing from both of you is that at least in your cases, the, the less Asian you behave, uh, uh, the better it is politically. Not necessarily. Or, or, as far as I didn't, I didn't <laughs> as far as touting the fact that, uh -huh. that you're Asian, you're saying you got elected uh, uh, with, because you were running as a candidate for everybody. Right. And I, I think I was elected in my district because the residents felt I was the most qualified to serve in the district. But I'm you know, very proud of my, my Asian heritage. Yeah. So let me ask you, Michelle, is there um, an Asian identity separate from the particular okay. identities? Uh, Andrew Doe, who is the third, uh, the third Asian American, uh, is, uh, is Vietnamese. Uh, he succeeded Janet Nguyen, who mm -hmm. was the first Vietnamese on the Board of Supervisors. Um, uh, you know, you're Korean, you're Japanese, they're Vietnamese. Do you identify more with your particular ethnicity or is it more like we're Asians? You know, I think uh, both. Because when you go to their community, then, you know, you act like you're a Korean American. Then, you know, when I go to actually Korean American community, I am Korean American. So I act like, I behave like Korean American. When I go to the mainstream, it's totally different. But most of people actually, ethnic uh, communities, plus mainstream communities, they're all asking the same thing, that they want to have better government 
and they will have less tax money spending, wasting at the government side. So, you know, they're always talking about the same thing, but mostly, I don't know about Lisa, for, but for me, most of fundraisings and support coming from Asian Americans. So it's very important, but at the same time, I think we understand that different culture. So I think we can add more to the, you know, uh, Orange County government. So I think we are doing a much better job. And then I am not putting other people down, but you know, we understand that all different communities, especially Orange County, that we have a lot of Asian Americans that mm -hmm. we understand each community. So I think that's what people are looking at, that okay. you know, they're gonna do a good job as a government person. Yes. Also, uh, besides the uh, eth ethnicity issue, there's gender. Mm -hmm. And you're both, uh, you're both women, and you occupy now the two high official positions on the board of supervisor, of chair and, and vice chair. Uh, how much of a factor is, is gender in, uh, in politics and in what you do on the board? Well, I think as women, especially the only two women on the board of supervisors, uh, Michelle and I bring a different perspective than the men. And, you know, elected officials across the nation, women elected officials only comprise 21 percent. So it's still a very small percentage nationwide. To have Although women it's, in uh, it's been going up uh, over the years. It, and, it has uh, been going up. And, and as we speak, there might be, uh, uh, you know, I realize <laughs> you're both Republicans, but there appears to be a good chance there could be a woman in the White House very soon. <laughs> We don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, do you ever like split off into guys and gals when you're talking about things on the board of supervisors? Uh, a lot. Yeah. A lot. You said a lot. <laughs> but uh, you know what? Actually, Lisa came from the local community, from the city. I came from the tax agency. We think different, but you know what? Um, we don't agree 100%, but most of the time that as a woman, mm -hmm. that we understand better, we are more sensitive to the you know, staff, and we yes. work much close, and then we understand better of those details. So I think we do a better job, don't we? Yes, I, Michelle I and I work very well together mm -hmm. on the Board of Supervisors, and, and like I said, I think we just bring a different perspective as women. Um, when we take a look at some of the issues relating to the County of Orange, um, women just have a different perspective than men do about a whole host of things, whether it be the homelessness issue or the animal shelter. Was that uh, all right? So, uh, because you're women, you're going to just spend more money on animal shelters and no. the homeless than the. <laughs> <Not> a, <laughs> in, in general, Michelle and I are very, you know, conservative mm -hmm. Republicans, and I think we both want the same thing in government. We want to keep government small, mm -hmm. uh, accountable, transparent. Okay. Uh, let's talk about some of the issues that are facing the county. Um, I, I asked uh, I asked your staffers before the show, uh, you know, what you might want to talk mm -hmm. about. Uh, one of the things that that you mentioned was uh, property tax equity. So, do you want to, uh, Michelle? Do you want to open up on that? Well, what is when you say? Property tax equity is a big issue. What are you talking about? Property tax money is supposed to come back to the county, but when San Diego, we, we just kind of like almost same size. San Diego pays about $640 billion, and we actually, Orange County property tax is about $699 billion. Okay, so this we is, pay. This is, sta this is property tax money that goes, goes to, the to the state of California. Right. Money comes back. Is actually San Diego gets about nine hundred million dollars. We get about six hundred forty million. So we get about what six cents per you know whatever we right. return. And, and in the other, whole state, Orange County gets less back than anybody right. else. Right. right. And it's really the the inequity is that there are fifty eight counties in the state of California, and Orange County gets back six cents on the dollar for every dollar we send to Sacramento. Mm -hmm. The average county receives 17 cents. So we're literally getting one third of what the average county and so, receives. And so? We have to do more with less. <laughs> right. And uh, so, I mean, you're raising that as an issue, but there's nothing that you can do about it. There's not, no way that Sacramento is going to change that. Well, at least not in the short term, but we are continuing to work on that. What could possibly ever be done in Blue State, California, that would make them decide, oh, we should, we should let Orange County have more? Well, I, I think the Republicans need to have more of a stronghold up in Sacramento, get more Republicans elected to office. Um, we need to change the tide, and until that takes okay. place, I think the tax equity issue is still going to right. remain at large. There's, well, yeah. th there is one, because 
this, um, when they divide the money for 58 different counties, it, it happened before 1978, Prop 13. So at that time, they divide up by the government sizes that. And now that, you know, they have a one pie that each county is sharing yeah. it. So they have to actually, state has to change it every year by the population and by the different size uh -huh. of government. So that has to be fair because we're getting so much less and our hands been tied and tried to work. It's not that that we want to waste more taxpayers' money or we try to get more taxpayers' right. money. We have to get, get fair amount I of know. money. I, I, I yeah. get it. Mm -hmm. And uh, public officials in Orange County always bring that up. And it's like, okay, you know, life is unfair. It just ain't going to happen. You know, it's uh, you We're know, but, but, but I'm, I'm glad you're out there, you know, pounding that issue. Mm -hmm. Another one that both of you mentioned was AB 109. Mm -hmm. uh, explain, uh, uh, Lisa, briefly what that is and why that's important to you. Okay, AB 109 is the early release of prisoners from our state prisons back to the local right. counties. And Sacramento has given us um, some money to handle the, the transference of right. those prisoners back, but certainly not enough. And there's the ripple effect within our communities as well. Um, the increases of, uh, of crime, and public safety issues have occurred. So it, it's something that we're all grappling with, um, AB 109 and then also Prop 47, which is the conversion of felonies to misdemeanors. That was the reduced sentences. Mm -hmm. I just had Sheriff Sandra Hutchins, another another highly ranking <laughs> uh, woman official uh, on this show, and she talked about, actually, to her, Prop 47 is an even bigger uh, problem. She thinks the reduced sentencing has mm -hmm. caused some problems and may be contributing to the rising crime rate. I don't know if you how you feel about that or have any Well, in a number of communities, at least in South County, some of the crime has spiked up for petty theft, about 47%, which is pretty significant. Yeah, yeah. Something that neither of you mentioned, but I'd like to ask you about, because I think it's a huge issue, and it's one that people often mention, are the unfunded pension liabilities that not just Orange County, but everybody mm -hmm. is grappling with. Uh, how concerned are you about that? I mean, we're talking about billions, uh, or you know, uh, hundreds of millions, uh, if not billions Actually, of dollars. Actually, billions of dollars in uh, Orange County. It is very important, but a lot of people are actually making mistakes that pension, unfunded pension liability, they said, oh yeah, it's four, five billion dollars, that's big money. It changes every year. It depends on the recession or economy is good or how many people are working until what year and then, you know, people, how long they live. Actually, that's another thing too. So people have to understand, but it's from the local government everywhere. Actually, in my city, uh, I have, in my district, I have about 10 cities. So I have a you know, mayor's breakfast every year, and they just don't get it. So what we are doing is try to make understand these what's unfunded pension liability and how we're going to take care of it. So I had a class actually last week with those city mayors and city council members. We really have to look at it that that's the debt that our kids have to pay for it. So we look very carefully. Actually, we have a very conservative board that a uh, board lowered that rate of return from 7.5 to 7.25 percent. That's really good, but still the 7.25 percent is too high. So we really yeah. have to look at the numbers and then what we're going to do in the future, we have to decide. Of course, people read all the time. I mean, to, to bring it home, you know, you th uh, when we throw numbers around people's, uh, it's hard to wrap around it, but uh, we honor the work of the safety forces. But your typical policeman or fireman now retires. They're going to get a pension of more than $100,000 a year. Mm -hmm. uh, they make very good money. They get huge pensions. Taxpayers, very few of whom mm -hmm. retire with that kind of a deal, uh, have to pay for that. Let me ask each of you, um, uh, while it may seem politically impossible, the concept of taking public employees moving forward and having them have a 401k rather than the kind of defined benefit plans they have now. Are you in favor of that? I've always been in favor of the defined contribution plan where you've got the employees that contribute to It's like their a 401, like, everybody, Perhaps, like right. everybody in the private sector. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And if we had had that in the public sector for the long term, we wouldn't have these um, high pension issues that we've got. Um, you know, Orange County, fortunately, we're paying off our bankruptcy debt mm -hmm. um, by next year. And I 
would hope that we would take some of that excess cash that we don't have to pay towards the debt and put that towards our county's unfunded pension liability so we can start to pay that down. Right. Uh, Michelle, how do you feel about the concept that at some point public officials need to start talking to the unions and saying, you know, not for what you've already earned, but going forward, it's got to be a new plan. Exactly. That's what we are doing, actually. When we negotiate that they are paying more of their portion of the pension goes in instead of governments paying it. So we are going right directions, but we are, we are not really yeah. fast and enough. And when now does rubber meet the road? Uh, you've got some negotiations coming up soon, don't you? Uh, isn't it going to be that season pretty soon? Oh, yes, with uh, AOCDS and a Which is AOCDS is the sheriff's It's the deputies. Association of uh, Deputy Sheriffs. Okay, and that's later this year. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. Lots of luck. Okay, let's talk about two projects that uh, one for each of you. Uh, Lisa, you have been very involved first as a mayor of Dana Point and now as a supervisor in the harbor restoration at Dana Point. How big a deal is that for Dana Point? It's a big deal for Dana Point. It's, it's a big deal for me. That's why I ran for Dana Point City Council in the first place. Um, I moved into the city in 1989 as it was getting incorporated. And I was promised the next year a brand new Dana Point Harbor and Town Center. So in 2006, I decided to run for city council and get these projects moving forward. Um, but as you know, government moves very slowly. Um, mm -hmm. But in my first four years on the Dana Point Council, we were able to get a master plan approved by the City, County, and Coastal Commission for the harbor and for Town Center. And Town Center is now progressing beautifully. And our Dana Point Harbor project has been 18 years in the making, and we are actually breaking ground June 29th of this year. So I'm thrilled that this project is finally moving forward. Yeah, anybody that drives in Dana Point now, you can just see the uh, the change. And mm -hmm. is it, it's, it's almost like, are you hoping for kind of a Santa Monica vibe, or what are you trying to do there? We just want to remain a really vibrant um, coastal community and kind of keep up with the times. And a lot of the buildings over the years just became very dated. So now we've got updated structures and new structures in town center. And I look forward to a completely revitalized harbor. Okay. It's so. going to be a great project. And instead of having the county, um, we had two choices. The county could either build out the harbor or we could have uh, a, a public-private partnership arrangement or mm -hmm. P3 arrangement. And in, in costing out both sides, I said, you know, I, my focus is to keep government small. And instead of growing county government to manage and build out the harbor, I said, why don't we basically partner with the private sector and have the private sector take the uh, financial risk, build out the harbor, and the county will have a revenue stream, which goes into the Tidelands Trust. So I, it's going to create a lot of um, new jobs for the private sector community, which will be great for the local economy in Dana Point. And I think we're going to end up with a really stellar project. Okay. And uh, you're trying to do something, Michelle. Uh, uh, Lisa has the boats. You've got the planes. Exactly. You've got John Wayne Airport. <laughs> so what, what's happening there? Um, we want to get port of entry status from the federal government. We applied it a few years ago, and we got rejected. So last November, we did again, and we actually getting help from all other congressmen in our district, like you know Ed Royce and Dana Rohrbacher, Mimi Walters, and Loretta Sanchez. So everybody's helping. So a bipartisan effort to get port of entry status. Uh, what will that do? Does that? It sounds bureaucratic. Will it help? <laughs> will it help like with uh, commerce or what? Help for commerce and tourism because they're worried about that. You know, we need more cargo planes coming in. But Orange County, as you know, that you know we cannot really bring the cargo plane coming in. But Washington, D.C., that, you know, people working there, they just don't understand Orange County itself because we have L.A. port, we have Long Beach Harbor, and then we have LAX, so they have enough cargo. But we have, instead of that, that we have Disneyland and Knott's Berry Farm, and more tourists are needed in our economy. So we want to bring more people. I thought we get all the tourists. They're all coming we, in, right? We they do, fly to do. LAX <laughs> and then they go to Disneyland. What? No, but I'd rather them to coming in because we have right now that two <laughs> countries are coming in from Mexico and Canada. But I want to open a little more so more people coming in to spend more money, not staying in LA. Uh, hotels, but how about Orange County hotels? And right now they do that us? because it costs a little more to fly into John Wayne. Is yeah, cost uh, seventeen dollars fifty cents. They have to 50. pay so that's plus, why co plus five dollars for you know usage fee. So that's a lot of money. And we're talking about we are collecting about four million dollars per year instead of that four million that 
it's going to cost the federal government only $1.3 million. So they are still thinking, they are watching it, and they are looking at it, and we're going to work on it. Well, it sounds like you might have a little better luck with, with that than with the property tax equity. But once again, you know, <laughs> trying to make a case for Orange County uh, you know, can, be, can be pretty tough. But mm -hmm. anyways, Lisa... Michelle, thank you so much for coming on and uh, keep uh, adding your uh, fresh perspective to the Board of Supervisors. Okay, thank you. Well, that's it for now. Thanks again to my guests, Supervisors Lisa Bartlett and Michelle Steele. You can watch this show and past shows by going to pbssocal.org or rickreef.com. You can also catch our shows and our post-show open mic chatter on YouTube and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by Five Point. Five Point is an independent real estate development company with assets under management across California. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Memorial Care is transforming the way healthcare is delivered, keeping our communities and businesses healthy by guiding them on the path to wellness with easily accessible hospitals, physician offices, and outpatient centers. Memorial Care, leading the way.